We have been dealing with different components of the psyche as a structure and different components of the psyche as a process. Further, the question arises. How does all this work as a whole, in the norm, in the ideal? And what deviations from the norm and from the ideal can there be? For now, we will confine ourselves to just an intuitive understanding that the psyche solves the task of governance. Accordingly, the stability of the psyche is its ability to guaranteedly solve various kinds of tasks of governance under the impact of external circumstances over prolonged intervals of time. Because, after all, all short processes are fragments of longer ones, or they flow against their background. Therefore, the longer the process, the more grounds and hopes to reveal something interesting in it. Here is a picture. What is depicted here? This large rectangle here, bounded by a bold line, is, in terms of theory of governance, an enclosed system, that is, the object of governance and the system of governance towards it, situated under the impact of the external environment. Within its boundaries, there are information transformer and executive bodies. The function of the information transformer is to work out a governorial decision on the basis of incoming flows of information. The executive bodies are what implement the governorial decision into life. What are the incoming flows of information like? One flow is from the external environment and the second flow is from the object of governance itself, characterizing its internal state and its reaction to governance. There are also two flows of impacts coming from executive bodies. One flow of impacts is the impact on the external environment, and the other flow of impacts is the impact on the object of governance itself. In relation to man, to an individual, the object of governance is his organism, the system of governance is his psyche, but the external environment, it's understandable that this is the whole life in which we find ourselves. This diagram of governance shows the mode of functioning when the incoming flow of information is immediately transformed into a governing impact. What is not here? Here there is no memory. What consequences does this entail? This entails such consequences that if there is an external subject, then into the flow of information from the external environment, this subject can unload its governorial signal, which will lead to the fact that the information transformer will work out such a governorial decision that will meet the interests of the external subject. There is another variant. How is it different from the first picture? There is one more square. The difference is that the incoming flows of information enter into the memory and all the information necessary for the working out of a governing impact is drawn from the memory. What is the difference in governance according to this scheme and according to the first scheme? 
The difference is that if there is a subject in the external environment who unloads a governorial signal into the flow of information from the external environment, and all this is loaded into the memory, then there is no guarantee that the external governorial signal will have an impact on the working out of a governorial decision in the present. But one more question arises. Since the memory arrays can be quite large, the process of working out a governorial decision will take a little longer with the same power of the information transformer. If we consider it at short time intervals, then such a scheme for the working out of governorial decisions turns out to be more noise immune than the first scheme, where a governorial decision is a function of the factually flowing incoming streams of information. If we consider it at longer time intervals, it may turn out that the information that was part of the external signal with claims to govern the subject, some time later will form the basis for the working out of a governorial decision. Accordingly, the question arises as to what can be done to exclude this. Then, the third scheme of governance appears. How does it differ? It differs in that, before entering into the memory, the information passes through a certain algorithm sentinel, which verifies it on the theme, reliable, unreliable, non-determined. That which is reliable is loaded into the memory, and that which is non-determined is loaded into the quarantine. Further, a governorial decision is worked out on the basis of the reliable memory segment, but along with this, assigned to the information transformer is an additional mission of a double kind. Firstly, to analyze everything that is in the quarantine. Secondly, to improve the algorithm sentinel based on the analysis of what is in the quarantine and how effective governorial decisions are. It is clear that if the system operates in this mode and the power of the information transformer is the same, then the performance speed will be even lower than in the second case. However, noise immunity will be the highest of all three of these schemes. What does this mean in terms of our daily life, practice, activity? This means that if we concern ourselves with making sure everything is good, then the normal mode of functioning of our psyche is the third. The second can be regarded as a mode of functioning in some potentially dangerous situations when there is still time to work out a more or less normal, in terms of efficiency, governorial decision. And the first scheme is a mode of governance in a catastrophic situation when performance speed is the first priority indicator of the functioning of the system of governance. This is the case that is characterized by the words at least some governorial decision is better than none. Well, 
If we sum up all the aforementioned, it turns out that man must exercise self-control in order for everything in his life to be more or less safe and problem-free. And the problems, inherited from past times, should slowly and steadily remain in the past, and their consequences should be smoothed out. The functions of this self-control include the following things. These are questions about the emotion meaning structure and the restoration of the lost correct emotion meaning structure at the pace of activity. The second question is to attentively monitor that the psyche works in this third mode. When both the algorithm sentinel and the quarantine function and the information transformer is engaged not only in making governorial decisions, but also in analyzing what is happening in the quarantine and it perfects the algorithm sentinel. And if we talk about longer intervals of time, then another task is to attentively monitor that the chain of epiphany by distinction, attention, meaningful comprehension of the given in distinction, perfection of the world view and world understanding, and the activity based on the perfected world view and world understanding would never stop. Because violation of any aspect of self-control in this area is potentially fraught with all sorts of troubles. It has already been said that we all, one way or another, generate a collective psyche. The collective psyche has its own collective intellect. The collective psyche in the Latin-speaking tradition is called egregor. The reality is such that any individual psyche always interacts with these or those egregors. This leads to the question of what role every specific individual can play in this or that egregor. The roles are varied. One can be simply an energy resource of an egregor. That is, all your energy power, except for what you need to maintain vital activity at a minimum level, will go into some egregors, and you will feel constantly broken. This is a mode, let's say, of a cash cow or a battery, all functions of which are reduced precisely to the energy supply of some system. The second mode is to be an executive mechanism of the egregor. In other words, in this case, all your interests, all your objectives of activity, all methods of activity, one way or another, are excited to action by the egregor, and your will, your meaningful comprehension, is excluded from the process of working out of governorial decisions throughout the entire function of governance. Starting from detecting the problem of setting of objectives, and ending with the realization of the governorial decision. This mode fully corresponds with what can be called egregorial possession. The only difference from demonic possession is that the demon, from the point of view of the world understanding on the basis of the tri-unity of matter information measure is an informational algorithmic virus 
If we draw analogies with the computer, which is recorded on a certain field structure that is introduced into man's biofield and energetically fed from him, impacting his psychic activity and energy, one way or another distorting them. And in this case, the field body of the egregor can exist by itself, and our biofields are only in some way connected with them. And we cannot say that the egregor has entered into us, primarily because our organism cannot withstand the energy power of this egregor, localized in the organism itself. Another variant for the interaction of man with the egregor, it can be called egregorial leadership. That is, the egregorial leader is an operator in relation to the entire egregor. He determines the mode of functioning of the egregor, and the egregor is subjugated to his meaningful will. In this aspect, he is above the egregor, but, at the same time, the organization of the psyche and the energy of the egregorial leader is such that he himself is a prisoner of the egregor and he cannot go beyond it without outside help. For this reason, no egregorially alien information can reach the egregorial leader while he is in the power of the egregor. One more mode can be called programmer. That is, the person himself is independent of the egregor, but he can interact with it, and his psyche is such that he can change the algorithmics of the egregor, the objectives of its functioning, informational algorithmic support of the egregor. After that, the egregor will function in a slightly different mode. The quality of life and the character of the activity and resources of the egregorial and executive mechanisms of the egregor and egregorial leaders, which may not be one but several, will change. In addition, there is another variant. It may turn out that the personality, for some reason, can carry information and algorithmics of such significance in newospheric egregorial processes that the personality himself turns out to be in the rank of an egregor. The situation is mentioned in some sources. Such people are called Odin, which coincides with the name of the Old Norse god. Where I have come across this, the stress was put on the O. This is often done. But the question in this case is not in the subtleties of the word usage, but in the essence that stands behind the word. Then the question arises, what is normal? After all, normal turns out to be for a man to be in the status of programmer in relation to all socially conditioned egregors. And the transition into other statuses can only be according to discretion, proceeding from the decision on some specific tasks. Moreover, if we talk about the egregors with which the psyche of the individual alternatively interacts, then they can be divided into two categories. Biospheric egregors, 
connected with landscapes in which he is either born or in which he starts his life after moving to another place, because it's not always like after moving to another place, a person can continue to live, because local biospheric egregors may not accept him, after which health problems, various kinds of situational problems will begin. That is, if, for example, in your homeland you are lucky, then, after you come to another place, you may begin to be unlucky in extra-social aspects. The second group of egregors is culturally conditioned egregors, which took shape in the historical past, take shape in the present. Some of them have lifetimes longer than that of a person, and some of them take shape, function, and disintegrate within the limits of the duration of the life of a person. Cultural egregors, confessional egregors, cover the lives of many generations. Professional egregors cover only the time of the existence of professions or the functioning of a person as a representative of a particular profession. Nonetheless, this aspect must be borne in mind, and one should think about one's personal relationships with those egregors that may be. The most difficult situation, of course, is for those people who have long been connected with some one egregor, and they live completely under its power. Why? Because it's very difficult for such a person to draw the line between what is his personal property and what is the informational algorithmic content of the egregor. If a person's life has taken shape in such a way that in different periods of life, sometimes in the course of the same day, he turns out to be connected with different egregors, then he may notice that on the same question in the course of the day, with the same initial data for solving the task, he works out mutually exclusive opinions. Why so? Because when one opinion is worked out, it's connected with one egregor, and the information and algorithmics of this egregor are involved in the working out of this opinion. And when he is committed to a different opinion, then some other egregor is involved in this process. And this circumstance can be understood by the person not as his own internal schizophrenia or a consequence of eicentrism, but as a result of the fact that due to the peculiarities of his psyche, he can dance between different egregors. One of the typical variants when this occurs is the consequence of interconfessional marriages, interethnic marriages, and the impact of telegony. That is, when a child has one father by sperm and by biofield, all the men of his mother who have been in her life are his fathers. Since in the ancestral egregors of different people, on the same questions, there may be mutually exclusive information and algorithmics, then when one thing appears, it may not coincide with what comes from other egregors and what correlates with one's own memory. That is, in our memory, there is a personal component localized on the material carriers of our organism, and there is also an egregorial component thanks to which a person can have access to information that he has not actually had access to in his life.
as one of the variants, memories of past lives, this is access to egregorial memory. This is not necessarily your personal memory, because the literature describes such things that in a state of hypnosis, one comrade is interested in questions of his past life. He says that he is a merchant, the owner of a ship, he goes sailing, pirates attack him, and the leader of the pirates kills him. In the next session of hypnosis, he reveals that he was born somewhere in a fishing village. Then he stopped fishing, became a pirate, in the end, led the pirates. One time he attacked the ship, where he killed such and such a merchant. That is, it turns out that in one and the same period of time, one and the same soul was both the pirate and the merchant. This is not the only case of this kind, because another person, also in the state of hypnotic trance, recalling past lives, recalled how he gave birth to a child as a woman. And in another session, he recalled how he was born from that woman. To interpret this kind of evidence of past lives, either another idea of creation is required, when the same soul in different worlds can perform different functions, or it should be assumed that the same soul in some cases can operate with different bodies in the same historical time. Therefore, the question of past lives is a question that is not in vain closed for most people, for the simple reason that if past lives did take place, then the mistakes made in them are somehow forgotten and do not affect the further development of the soul and solutions of Navia's ethical problems in this life. Because when man lives thoughtlessly, then everything that comes from egregorial algorithmics is worked out in an automatic mode, willlessly, thoughtlessly. And if one looks at the biographies of one's own relatives over several generations, it turns out that if society is characterized by a thoughtless life, oriented only on satisfying physiological needs and some traditional everyday interests, then, in the fate of one's own relatives, the same situations are factually repeated in different decorations. The same algorithms work, and they make the same mistakes on the condition that everyone lives thoughtlessly. The only way out of the captivity of such egregorial ancestral slavery is a conscious meaningful relation towards life and the manifestation of objectives that go beyond the physiological and everyday needs, that is, the meaning of life of a different kind. For this, man must engage in personal development and not be a humanoid animal, zombie or demon. And this requires will and sincere confession of what can be called the providence of the Almighty and man's share in it. Why am I saying a sincere confession? Because if a person is sincere and makes mistakes in something, then, through the chain, epiphany by distinction, attention, meaningful comprehension, and perfecting the worldview, on condition that the person lives on the basis of this third scheme, with the algorithm sentinel and the quarantine, all his mistakes in world understanding, including mistakes in the confession of providence, will be eliminated over time, and there will be no negative consequences. 
Further, it turns out that the situation when the psyche of man is enclosed on several egregors, including conflicting egregors, is a very dangerous situation. For what reason? Because in every socially conditioned egregor, if not in every one, then in many, there is a component that can be characterized as the immune system of the egregor. Its only task is to neutralize and destroy everything that carries egregorially alien information. And if a person finds himself in a situation where he is enclosed on two conflicting egregors, and in relation to one of them, the information carried by egregorially alien others, not subject to compatibility, then the egregor's immune system, which is aimed at destroying such people, is launched. Destruction can proceed in two ways, either diseases or the emergence of a situation of meat grinders from which it is impossible to get out alive or not crippled. What to do? One should meaningfully comprehend what comes from which egregor and determine what is the bro and what is evil, because this is really the only informational protection in all processes connected with the interaction of the personality and the newer sphere of the planet, including all egregors, both social and biospheric landscape ones. Неужели все эгрегоры такие страшные, что а, готовы просто человека убивать? Все, если, ну, ну, может быть, достаточно mm. его просто от себя отключить, да, как-то. А потом есть же эгрегоры более мощные, ну, да, есть которые. Эгрегоры разные. There are different egregors. Есть вот такие ситуации, потому что. But there are also such situations I have seen. when egregors on the father's and mother's lines are mutually conflicting. As a result, instead of a biography, the child has a medical history. Yes, life is diverse. There are other examples. There are examples when a person sits in the same egregor, he has no conflicts with this egregor, and the egregor carries him through life. And he is lucky, that is, he does not have any troubles, because the egregor conducts him through them, or, in these troubles, the egregor puts someone else. This situation is also possible. Yes, wars between egregors are also possible. Ultimately, this manifests itself in wars within society. Ну, а если, например, вот эгрегор команды футбольный Спартак, эгрегор в команды футбольной Динамо, они же вроде как враги, правильно? Yes, they are. Но они же друг друга не уничтожают. И... And what? There aren't fights between fans? Было, но тем не менее. Они же, они же как бы не действуют друг другу на поражение. Совсем. Well, why? Fatalities also occur in fan fights. Another thing is that they are approximately equivalent in power. And among other things, both of them are elements of the single football egregor. Therefore, there, there is such a theatrical show as the struggle of nanai boys. When one person is wearing two fur coats, in such a way that their collars are at the level of the waist, the hoods are sewn, he bends, boots are also put on his hands from the outside, and it looks like two struggling with each other boys. In fact, this is one person portraying a struggle. Many egregors are really like that, with many heads. And the struggle, their life is always some kind of internal conflict. And if you look at the history of Russia over the past millennium, 
then the civilizational egregor of Russia is internally conflicting. It can be likened to a many-headed, many-legged hydra, which moves, constantly stepping on its own feet, becomes entangled in them, stumbles over, falls. Then it sees a terrible snout in front of it and blocks oxygen to the snout. Then it turns out, ah, this is my own snout. Therefore, the question of the conflict of egregors is not the simplest question in life. And the problem is that if we start listing all the egregors that are, then, firstly, the sensitivity of any of us will not be able to detect all of them. And besides, there have been so many of them throughout history, and so many in the present, that we will simply get confused. And in fact, in lectures we point out that such a problem exists, we live with it, and in order to solve it, it's necessary for everyone to deal with the questions of personal egregorial interaction. Moreover, if we talk about the historical past, then, in Soviet times, Ivan Antonovich Yefremov, in the novel The Hour of the Bull, directly describes it as if it is an already accomplished fact in the distant future that mankind made a lot of efforts to cleanse the newest sphere of the planet of evil, lies and everything else. And we live in an era when this process is not only not completed, but also not started, because it can flow only in the mode of our, each person's, meaningful, volitional impact on the entire egregorial system of the planet through our own emissions of biofields with a determined meaning. Therefore, everything is not so simple here, and dialectics as an instrument of cognition is one of the means of resolving this problematics. And since we have returned to the theme of cognition, then an opinion is expressed and the question arises, is it true or false? And here it is necessary to point out the fact that the only principle that makes it possible to distinguish between life-consistent opinions and delusions is the principle, practice is the criterion of truth. That is, if you are offered a recipe that should result in a Napoleon cake, you act in full accordance with the recipe, but it turns out that you get who knows what, then this recipe is false. Well, here the situation is like this. If you stupidly follow the recipe, then you will anyway succeed, on condition that the ingredients are not falsified and the stove is alright. Yes, perhaps it won't be a masterpiece of confectionery art, but nonetheless, it will be quite an edible and recognizable cake. And if, in the end, you have something different or nothing, then there is some know-how which the author of the recipe did not consider it necessary to share. For example, from such know-how, everyone knows that borscht includes beet. But few people know that the taste of borscht is different depending on whether the beet is grated or cut with a knife into small strips. The borscht where the beet is not grated but cut into small strips is tastier and healthier. I don't know why, but nonetheless it is so. But this anyway refers to the fact that the procedure for obtaining the result described in the recipe should lead, with an accuracy acceptable for practice, 
to the result that is described. If we talk about errors, this is about discrepancies between what we will get and what is described in the recipe. Then, if everything is correct, the result that we have is better than what is described in the recipe. But then here there arises another question. Okay, the principle practices the criterion of truth is good, it works well in relation to the past, and if we are going to do something, so we have a project, if the project is wrong, then we carry it out, and after that we come up with lots of negative effects. Does the principle, practices the criterion of truth, not work in this case? Concerning this, there are two mutually exclusive opinions. One opinion says that yes, the principle practices the criterion of truth, does not work in the mode of anticipating any troubles. And the other answer says that the principle of practices the criterion of truth works both in relation to the past and proactively. It can prevent all sorts of troubles. But this requires certain psychological skills. Let's take a look at a simple, real historical example. The first Soviet rocket-powered fighter, Bi-1, crashed in flight. The pilot, Grigory Yakovlevich Bakhchivanji, died. What is the history of the question? The plane was aerodynamically optimized on the basis of scientifically grounded aerodynamic techniques. Low speeds, at which the compressibility of gas and air could be neglected. In one of the flights, in a dive, a speed close to the speed of sound was reached. At such flight speeds, the compressibility of air cannot be neglected. As a result of the air compressibility, pressure is redistributed over the surface, which is flowed around by the incoming airflow, and all aerodynamic forces and moments, from the point of view of mathematics, are integrals over the surface of the airplane from the pressure at each point. If there is air compressibility, then other aerodynamic theories should be used. It is necessary to build another wind tunnel in which the flow velocities corresponding to the real flight mode would be achieved and then the aerodynamic layout of the aircraft will be made in such a way that flight will be safe. You see, if we talk about intellect, then the phenomenon of air compressibility in the process of flow was known beforehand. And in principle, a person could have guessed that if it comes to high flight speeds, then the aircraft should be designed differently. But I don't know if there are such documents that would say that V.F. Belkhavitinov, the leading designer of the plane, did not pose these questions, or he did, but received a negative answer, and as a result, Bakhchivanji died. This is an example of the fact that even if you rely on intellect, then many troubles are preventable. And the principle practices the criterion of truth also works in the aspect of intellectual activity anticipating troubles, works on the basis of the knowledge that science managed to work out in the past. But what about situations for which science has not yet managed 
to develop knowledge on the basis of which it is possible to intellectually decide on the question of whether it is safe or not safe. The answer to this question is also connected with psychology. How is it connected? Every one of us can remember situations when our imagination drew nightmares. In the absence of reliable information about what was happening outside our perception, then reliable information came from beyond our perception and we found out that we were simply a victim of baseless, illusory fears and the games of our imagination. But, along with this, in the life of almost everyone, there were situations when intuition warned, don't do this, don't go there, or vice versa, do this, you have to do it. And then there arose a fork in the road, because, depending on our reaction to such warnings, we either followed the warnings of our intuition or did not. In those situations when we followed, then a plurality took shape in which everything was fine. And, in a number of cases, we found out why we shouldn't have done something, or vice versa, we should have done something. In other cases, we ignored the warnings of our intuition and either did something of our own discretion or did not do what our intuition offered. In these situations, we either faced some kind of trouble or found ourselves on the verge of reaping these troubles in full. There are two pluralities of situations in the life of every one of us. Some situations where our imagination draws groundless nightmares. And the second multiple situation is when our intuition really warns us. And what does the principle of practice is the criterion of truth have to do with it? And the principle of practice is the criterion of truth. Here is about the fact that if we recall not only situations, but we can reproduce in ourselves the mood that corresponded to situations of one kind and situations of another kind, then we will find that our mood in different situations was different. There is a mood when emotions are off-scale, emotions are negative, the imagination draws nightmares. And there are situations when emotions do not go off-scale, but intuition warns. And this difference in situations is a confirmation of the universality of the principle practice is the criterion of truth, not in relation to the implementation of certain projects, but in relation to the emotion meaning structure of a person in which he proactively knows that the project is potentially harmful or potentially dangerous and he needs to take some measures to prevent this project or to modify this project in such a way that it's safe for himself and for others. Indeed, psychology is the key science for solving all the problems of society. But for this, psychology must be metrologically consistent, and everything that is in the psyche must be detectable 
and correlated with the conceptual apparatus offered by this or that theory of personality or the theory of the collective psyche of society. Да, но вы сейчас рассказываете вещи, которые в современную психологию не входят никак и никак с ней не согласуют. Ну что поделаешь? Well, what can you do? Those who are not professionally qualified psychologists and who do not feed on this field of activity have a lot of complaints about modern psychology precisely because in modern psychology so many problems are ignored. And those that are not ignored are covered inadequately. But if we proceed from the fact that information is an objective category of being of creation, that it was before the appearance of man as a species, that it is, was, and will be before the appearance of any of us, then the psyche of man is simply a system that works with objective information, but works in a subjective way. And in modern psychology, even the question of how information gets into the psyche and what the psyche is, is not posed. Therefore, there are really many problems here. And the reality is such that one needs to deal with one's own psyche. One needs to have an idea of what a norm is what it consists of, how within this norm the components of the psyche should be linked to each other, both in statics and in dynamics. And the most difficult thing is to solve those tasks in the process of interacting with the environment, including an aggressive one, that is, to maintain the emotion meaning structure to make sure that a situation does not arise when, under the pressure of circumstances, it is necessary to leave the third scheme of interaction, the working out of governorial decisions, to make sure that the chain of distinction, attention, conscious comprehension, activity is not broken on the basis of a changed reconsidered world view and world understanding. Now, if you follow these tasks as first priority ones, then consciousness correctly sets tasks for the unconscious levels of the psyche and they solve them in a safe way, in a certain automatic mode. And then we safely travel through life on those automatisms that are in our unconscious levels of the psyche and those that we form. Then we find ourselves above egregors, but not below them, in an involuntary way. And we use egregors in the same way as we use objects of the technosphere. But this is a different quality of life. If, from these positions, we talk about what spiritual culture is, then spiritual culture is a personal culture, interaction of the individual with the newest sphere of the planet and egregors in its composition, both biospheric landscape and socially conditioned egregors. And further, we will deal with the theory of governance as such. What else can be said about intuition? Intuition is a multifaceted phenomenon, because into this word we load different by their nature processes. Firstly, this is the work of one's own sense of measure and unconscious levels of the psyche when the unconscious intellect gives out some warnings, some predictions, to the level of consciousness. In addition, 
Intuition also includes reading information from egregors, which know more than any of us, and their algorithmics in some cases also prognoses much of what can or will happen when egregorial algorithmics implements itself. But, in addition to egregorial and personal processes, intuition also includes what is called God's guidance or prophecies. When information about the future is given directly from above to man, Moreover, it is necessary to pay attention to the fact that intuition in the overwhelming majority of cases, in one form or another, warns against troubles. And this is expressed in the fact that in the history of human civilization, there are practically no predictions about any good variants for the development of the situation. In human history, all sorts of fulfilled prophecies about all kinds of disasters are remembered. Why? Because if you look at this question from the standpoint of the theory of governance, then it looks like this. There is a person or some social group that lives in a self-governing mode, interacting with the encompassing processes and among the encompassing processes, there is a hierarchically higher governance. This is governance from the side of the newosphere and its egregors, and this is almightiness. If the process of self-governance flows within the boundaries of what, from the point of view of the hierarchically highest governance, is acceptable, then there is no reason for him to show his hand in this process. And if the process deviates somewhere in the wrong direction, and the hierarchically highest governance is interested in the process continuing, and continuing within the acceptable boundaries, then the person must be notified that he is going somewhere wrong, and the consequences will be such and such. It is necessary to notify in order for him to change his setting of objectives and, accordingly, change the character of self-governance. If this is realized, then the promised predicted disaster does not occur. If this is not realized, then the predicted disaster occurs, and to people it remains memorable. For example, as with the prophecy of Cassandra about the Trojan War, if the Trojans, having heard Cassandra out, had heeded her, had put Paris under arrest for a week or two so that he would calm down, the situation would have changed. There would have been no Trojan War, Troy perhaps would still be standing, but who would remember Cassandra and unfulfilled prophecies? This is from the history of Mediterranean culture. In the East there is a saying, if you don't change direction, you may end up where you are heading. What is it about? It is about the fact that if we are really going where it will be very, very unpleasant, then it's better to change the direction of our movement. Here there is another thing. Psychologists sometimes try to conduct experiments on the theme. Does intuition exist or not? Does telepathy exist or not? Does man's consciousness have the ability to shift in frequency ranges and see, at the pace of the development of the situation, some processes that we can actually shoot only in conditions of ultra-high speed filming of several tens of thousands and hundreds of frames per second. The reality is such that these kinds of experiments violate ethics. 
and since ethics is a part of life, and it goes beyond the boundaries of human society, such experiments give a negative result. To put it differently, from their point of view, intuition does not exist, telepathy also does not exist, and so on and so forth. And experiments on the possibility of shifting consciousness in time also gave a negative result. But there are people who, in real life, solving their real problems or social ones, encountered manifestations of intuition, encountered manifestations of telepathy, encountered the fact that their consciousness, or the consciousness of their loved ones, shifted to other frequency ranges, as a result of which, that information, which is not always possible to obtain by technical means, became their property. This circumstance also exists. This circumstance leads to another question, which is related to what criteria of truth exist in the modern tradition of atheistic science. Although some schools stand on the fact that practice is the criterion of truth, the reality is such that in the overwhelming majority of cases, for them, the criterion of truth is the repeatability of results. But the reality is that the repeatability of results is not a criterion of truth, because you can give examples of mathematical calculations that lead to erroneous results because in them there are mistakes. And if you offer these calculations to others, then not everyone will find mistakes in them. If you search, there is an example of calculations on the internet when, in the end, it turns out that 2 is equal to 5. This is preceded by several lines of calculations, and not everyone can see that when one of the parentheses in the right and left sides of the equality is cancelled, then there occurs division by zero, which, in arithmetic, is forbidden. And if division by zero occurs, then the remaining factors can be anything, and 2 is equal to 5. And the equality, it really is true, on condition that the expression in parentheses is equal to 0. That is, the repeatability of the result and the interpretation of the obtained result is not at all a confirmation of the correctness of the result. And the criterion of truth is only practice in the sense that what is promised by the theory becomes reality in certain conditions. Because if the conditions are different, then the previous result is not guaranteed. And nonetheless, we live in a culture where this is the norm. For example, the second law of thermodynamics, one of the formulations, a perpetual motion machine of the second kind is impossible. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind is a hypothetical device that draws energy from some source until the temperature of this source reaches values close to absolute zero. On the basis of the second law of thermodynamics, for a long time, there was a cult version of the thermal death of the universe in the future, that everywhere the temperature would equalize and the universe would perish. The second law of thermodynamics, in this formulation, is present in almost every textbook on physics, and even more so, in textbooks on thermodynamics. But the following fact does not fall into textbooks. In 1866, 
Maxwell was solving a task. A column of gas in a gravitational field, in the absence of mixing of the upper and lower layers, and they obtained the result that the lower layers of this gas column will be warmer than the upper layers. This conclusion contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. Why? Because, in those models, on the basis of which the second law of thermodynamics is built, force fields are not included, but in nature they exist. And their effects exert an impact on the result. Accordingly, the second law of thermodynamics should say that a perpetual motion machine of the second kind is, in some way, technically possible. Then, there is an official circular from almost all academies of sciences and patent services of all countries of the world on the theme that projects of perpetual motion machines are not accepted for consideration. Nevertheless, we live in a culture where the principle of practice is the criterion of truth does not oblige anyone to anything, or they don't know how to use it, or do not wish to learn it. In reality, this is a principle that knows no exceptions, both in the aspects of natural science and in the aspects of humanitarian sciences, and most importantly, in the aspects of theology. Because whether there is God or not, this is not a matter of belief, this is knowledge, that is reliably confirmed ethically by the fact that God answers the prayer of the believer, the more clearly, the more responsive the believer is to the appeals of God to him through his service, through his inner world, through the language of life circumstances, through other people. Now that's it for today. Ну вот у меня вопрос такой по, скажем, языку жизненных обстоятельств, интуиции. Много раз и я сам, и там и родственники, знакомые все говорили: вот я чувствовал, вот не надо было туда идти, вот вот чувствовал, все равно пошел сделал, там получилось плохо. Но Чувствуешь ты, например, что не надо сегодня идти на работу, а как туда не пойти? Чувствуешь ты, что не надо идти на какую-то там встречу, которой ты там три месяца договаривался, и вот наконец-то вот, и ты возьмешь ее отменишь. Чувствуешь, ты выезжаешь уже куда-то на машине, ты вот уже поехал, скорость набрал, и как-то вот так это не, не надо туда ехать. Вот. Ну, 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 ну не можешь уже отменить все. В общем-то, реакция. But this is from the series of If There is a Storm Warning and We Live in the Era of the Sailing Fleet, then it's not necessary to leave the harbor for the sea. But if you really need to, then you can go to sea, but you need to control the sails and the ship in a completely different way, with some caution, and you shouldn't look for trouble. Да, но вот сколько со мной бывало, случалось то, я, я понимал, что что-то будет не так, я не могу это отменить, и я начинал себя вести очень осторожно, но срывался там, где я вообще не предполагал, что будет какая-то засада. One needs to come to the correct emotion meaning structure, and if this really cannot be cancelled, then one needs to ask the question, what to do, modify the project, enter the mode of a roundabout way, do something additionally on top of that, and in most cases, people really have no reaction to such warnings. Once the film, The Secret Monument, was shown, the film was dedicated to the tragedy that happened in the Soviet Navy in April 1970. The submarine K-8 was submerged in the Bay of Biscay. A fire broke out. The submarine came up to the surface. They struggled with the fire, 
and to survive for three days. Then the submarine sank, taking several dozens of people with it. They showed one of the widows of the crew members, and she said that she had seen the whole catastrophe in a dream about six months before it happened. Unfortunately, this was the era of dialectical materialism and atheism, and these hindrances of atheism and materialism, which denied intuition and all religiosity, led to the fact that the submarine actually sank. Because when this dream appeared to her, a thought or a prayer that it would not happen would have been enough, and nothing would have happened. The matrix within which this catastrophe and preparations for it were flowing would have collapsed, changed, modified in some way, and there would have been no catastrophe. Well, when the catastrophe happened, and the family members of the crew were informed about it, she already knew who was alive, who was dead, who had become widows. Therefore, the question of how to correlate with intuitive warnings is not univocal. It is always in the concretics of the situation. There are no general recipes, except that you need to somehow react to the situation. And the reaction can be different from internal mobilization to total ignoring and cancellation of intentions, or an appeal to the Almighty with a request for support in this situation and its successful resolution. But this is always concretics, and in this concretics, every person must decide himself what and how to do. There are no general recipes.